want to help her, but she went she, and you she can't. had reached out to me. You can't. I know, I, I know, but she had reached out to me that she wanted out because she called me saying that it was really messy and how bad it was. I am very worried about her. Yeah. What is going on? This is John with the Dr. John Deloney Show, a show about you and the mess you found yourself in or the, the ashes you're trying to climb out of. This is a show about real people going through hard stuff and trying to figure out the scariest question we can ask ourselves, what do I do now? I'm John Deloney, and I've been walking alongside people for, for, for 20 years or more, um, helping people figure out what the next right move is. And we're talking about mental health and emotional health on this show. We're talking about our marriages. We're talking about dating. We're talking about kids. We're talking about all of it. Whatever we're going through, um, my promise is I'll sit with you and we will work through it and figure it out. If you want to be on this show, give me a buzz at 1-844-693-3291. It's 1-844-693-3291. Or go to johndeloney.com slash ask. And before we get to our first call, um, we are recording this the day after Father's Day, so I hope it was great and wonderful for you all. As I asked some people and I got to work this morning, it was not great for some of y'all, so I hope this week is Father's Day week for some of y'all if you have to have to play makeup. Um, and don't forget, if you're going to buy supplements, buy from the best, go to thorn.com slash the letter U, thorn.com slash U slash Deloney for a massive, massive discount. All right, let's go to Lauren in Phoenix, Arizona. What's up, Lauren? Hello? How are we doing? Good. How are you? I, I mean, I, I don't know that I can be doing better. How, like, <laughs> how's Phoenix? Oh, it's actually not as bad of a summer as a lot of them, so can't complain. Very cool. My family back in Texas yesterday was 111, and I thought, oh, man, that is that is early to be that hot, so... I, I wish you all the best this, this summer. <laughs> Thank you. So what's up? How can I help? Well, my big question is my husband has clinical depression and just wondering what I can do to take better care of myself. Oh, man, that's hard. How long have you been married? We are going on 11 years now. Ooh. How long has he been um, struggling? Um, since he was a teenager. Okay. So just talk yeah, to... He was, go ahead. He was diagnosed when he was a teenager, but um, he's struggled with it probably since middle school age. Um, it was something when we were dating that he told me about, but kind of said, you know, it wasn't a big deal. And it was mentioned once. And then um, after we were married, I found out that it's a very big deal. Not that it would have been a deal breaker, but it was um, something I did not know how to handle. So paint us a picture of what life is like loving somebody and building a life with somebody who um, has been wrestling with clinical depression for most of their life. Well, I honestly didn't understand what depression was. I grew up in a family that didn't talk about mental health a lot. And um, it kind of, I took on a lot of blame for myself. Like, why, why is this so hard? It's because I'm not doing a good enough job. And in our 10 years, our first 10 years of marriage, we had already moved 10 times. We are in our 11th place and the longest we've ever stayed anywhere. And we've been here two years now. Um, but it's always like feeling like if you make a change, it'll be better. Um, we tried living by my family. We tried living by his family. We tried living in a better, warmer environment. We've tried all kinds of different things. And I just kind of like have this miraculous hope that things are just going to get easier for us. And of course, that doesn't always happen. Do you, do you recognize now after 10 moves in 10 years, that's not true? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, um, you've probably heard me say this on the show before, but the worst part about moving is that you go with you. Yeah. And the worst part about going around his family and your family and the new job, then a new place and then another new job. And then let's start our own business and all those cool things that just make life a, a, an adventure is that mm -hmm. you go with you. Yeah. And so yep. I, I will 
high five you and love you and be here on the phone. If you want to move again and you think something's going to be different out there. Um, I'm also fully ready to dive in. If you say I'm, I'm kind of done. If you say I'm kind of done running from this. I am. You sound tired. Huh? Very, Are you tired? <laughs> I'm very tired. Yeah. What happened that precipitated this call? Was there a blow up or a scare or a? Are you starting? Um, he got he got really sick with his stomach, and we've been in and out of the ER with it. And they kind of told us it's probably anxiety related, right? Um, and so I've been worried about his health a lot, and he hasn't been doing well. Um, I love my husband, and the reason I'm still here is because he's always trying trying to do better, trying to find the next thing that helps. Um, he's been through acupuncture. He's been through all kinds of things. The one thing I haven't gotten him to try is counseling. That's the hardest one for him. He went through a lot of it as a child and um, doesn't feel like it helps him, so he's not willing to try as an adult. So, oh, man. So I won't get into his... Um, clinical depression. If he wants to call the show, I'd be happy to walk down that rabbit hole with him. Um, uh-huh. And I'd be happy to lovingly and as I've done over the course of my career, I, I, I'd sit with him and I'll challenge him appropriately and love him appropriately. That's cool. The person who's on the phone with me today is you. And it's a hurting wife who's tired of watching her husband drown, who's frustrated when you're throwing a raft and he won't grab it. But then he yells, I've got a new backstroke that I'm going to try. And you jump in the backstroke with him and you find yourself further away from shore. And it, none, none of this stuff's working. So yeah. the only person on the phone is you. And so I'm going to tell you a couple of hard truths and give you some, some, maybe some things to try. Okay. Okay. Here's hard truth. Number one, you cannot cure or heal your husband's depression with a period at the end of that sentence. Yeah. You've been trying for more than a decade and you have to stop. You've got yeah. to, you've got to stop. Okay. In yeah, a, it's exhausting. It is. And in a really weird way, it creates what I call this inverted shame cycle where you try to help him. He knows you're trying to help him. He feels shameful that he has to get kind of help, this kind of help from his wife, which then in somebody struggling with clinical depression doesn't serve as a, as jet fuel, it serves as, you know, a pile of, of soil. It just buries you. And that makes you want to work harder to try to help. And you start saying yes to crazy ideas and weird things. And you're like, I'll try that. I'll try that. And then he feels ashamed that you tried that. You see what I'm saying? And it just creates this inverted loop. And somebody at some point has to break that cycle. And yeah. you're the one without clinical depression. So I want to point to you. Is that, is that a responsibility you would own? Yeah. Okay. Here's the greatest gift you can give your yourself. And as a result of taking care of you, your husband and your marriage. Okay. And that's for you to strongly and firmly begin to create really firm boundaries. Cause your husband has nothing to anchor into right now. Not that you can be yeah. his anchor forever, but he needs somebody in his life to say, I'm not moving anymore. I need a home. A friend of mine, when I was spinning out and I was out of control, uh, my wife called him, one of my close buddies, and he came home and I was talking about house. I'm going to sell this house and move to this house and we're going to move to this house. And by this time, mind you, my son had moved more times in his childhood than I had in my entire 35 years of life. And my buddy said, dude, your wife needs a home. And that sentence was um, like a, like a, it was like a knife in my chest. And so your, your husband doesn't have a friend like that. So that's going to be you saying, this is where we live. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to consider moving for three to five years. I need to make a home here. I need to make friends. I need to have people over to our house. Here are the things I am going to do because here's what I need. I need to exercise. I need to have friends. I need to have a local church. I need to have a, um, a movie theater that I go to, whatever the things are in your life, um, 
You have to be bold and willing to say, here's what I need. And here is where I am dropping anchor for a season. And because he has not experienced that, that will feel threatening. That will feel disruptive. And that might send him feeling lower. That is not your fault. Yeah. That's not your fault. That will be his adventure, his journey to heal in that capacity. But this is where we live. Or this is yeah. my job. So that's number one. Number two, you're going to have to feel guilt over resentment. And I say this all the time when it comes to like in-laws and stuff, but you're going to have to start saying out loud, here's what I need and here's what I want. And he might not be able to provide that for you because he's sick. Got it. You are going to go get it. You are going to go see a counselor. You are going to go see a marriage counselor, even if he won't go with you. You are going to make okay. sure you go to a dentist and a health club, and you're going to make sure that you are doing the things that keep you well and whole. And you haven't done that for a decade, have you? No, it's it's hard. Why is it hard, huh? I moved, I moved away from my support system so many times, and I just don't have anybody right now. I know. It's lonely. And he is my best friend, and he just doesn't feel good, and it's just hard. Are you willing to give him a picture of what well and strength and tiny little steps towards being um, whole look like? Yeah. Because I think you've spent a lot of time sitting with him in the sewage. And that's what great friends, that's what love looks like. I don't know, I've just, the biggest picture, the way to describe it is like he's on a roller coaster instead of me just staying steady. I just ride the ups and downs and I feel bad when he feels bad because I want to make him feel better and I can't. And the greatest gift you can give him is to get off the roller coaster completely. Just get off. Yeah. And it's not that you're running from him. It's that you're providing a stable base, a stable platform for him to, to, to anchor into. It, yeah. I, do, I don't see a path for him being well that's not going to include some sort of um, significant therapeutic intervention with a counselor. And maybe he's at a point where he needs to try ECT or ketamine or some sort of psychedelic. I mean, maybe he needs to bring in the heavy artillery, but he's going to have to do that therapeutically with a, with a, with a therapist who knows what they're doing. Yeah. And there's just no path forward. Yeah. And I want you to hear me. Seeing somebody who's suffered from major depressive disorder or clinical depression on the other side of some of those, um, after years of, they call it, um, like, I won't use those technical terms. It, it, it's depression becomes so, so challenging. And to see people on the other side of this that are, it's like a light came on. So I want you to hear me say there is hope. Thank you. There is what I would call radical hope. Friends of mine who just quit <sighs> drinking after a decade and after some of these treatments and they're a joy and they had kids and they're, they laugh a lot and they make fun of them old selves, like their old selves in, in, in unimaginable ways. Uh -huh. The hard part is you can't get him there. He's going to have to choose that path. What you can give him though is a real time picture of what it looks like. And he's, you're going to break that cycle I was talking about and everything in his body will try to reconstruct that cycle. He might get extra low. He might get extra mean. He might get extra fill in the blank. You can't control any of his responses to that. What you can control is this one sentence. I'm worth being well. Yeah. Whatever that looks like. Is that fair? Yeah. I'm really proud of you. I'm proud of you for loving this guy for more than a decade in the way you have. And I'm proud of you for saying, this is as far as I can go. And I don't know what to do. And I'm proud of you for calling. It's hard. I'm going to be proud of you every step of the way you take. Um, and by the way, healing from depression is, I mean, it's, it's, it's little wins, baby steps, little wins, little wins, little wins. 
tiny little steps that suddenly become big changes over time. It's like compound interest. And it's the weight of these massive changes that keeps people locked up. And it's that's, that's not how you heal from major depression. Major depression. It's teeny tiny things. And it's brain chemistry. And it's therapy. And it is some of these new therapies that have come out that are just looking to be magic. And it's a wife that says, I'm getting off the roller coaster. And I'm going to be well. I'm going to create a platform or a foundation for you to anchor into if you want to. And if you're willing to. Hang on the line here. I'm going to send you a copy of When Your Past Change Your Future. I want you to read that book. And I, here's my promise. I'll be with you every step of the way, sweetheart. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. Um, start taking care of, of Lauren. Start taking care of Lauren. Because that's the one person you can help right now. We'll be right back. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Folks, take a minute to think about how much time you spend on yourself. It's easy to get caught up in what people need from you and want from you and never think about what you need. And then you end up too stretched out, burned out, all of the madness of our current world resting on your shoulders. Look, sometimes I put my head down to work and then realize I haven't had a meaningful conversation with my wife and kids all day. I get focused on what I'm doing and I'm running and running and running and I don't know how to come back. And therapy is a great way to learn new skills that make you the best version of yourself. They help you set boundaries and still have energy left to help others without leaving yourself behind. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's totally online to fit into your schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So find more balance. Find wellness with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Deloney today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Deloney. All right, we're back. Let's go out to Asheboro, North Carolina, one of those beautiful places in the country. What's up, Bradley? Hey, Dr. John. How you doing today? Great, man. How are you? I'm doing good. What's up? Uh, well, so my question is, my I have five kids, and... They are at my mom's for the summer, just hanging out, doing summer fun things with them. And uh, basically, my wife and I, we are considering selling our current home and buying a new home while they're gone. Could it be easier to move with no kids getting in the way of moving? But is it weird to, like... Then go pick up the kids and just come back and be like, hey, here's our new house. Like, should we have a conversation with the kids, like, through FaceTime? Or, I mean, they're eight and under. So most of them, in my mind, like, won't even really be, you know, they're easily adjustable. But then again, at the same time, I I could see that being a big deal for kids. You have five kids, eight and under? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, They're all about 18 months apart. I bet your house is so... So incredibly still right now. Is it amazing? It is. It's, it's awkwardly still. Like I, I'm used to quiet being something is getting destroyed, and now it's just peace. And it, it, it's are, weird. Are they at your parents' house? Yeah, yeah. My mom. Are, is your mom and dad just like snorting Xanax off the bathroom counter? How are they doing this? <laughs> That's. I, 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 I don't know. They're, they're they they uh. They're troopers for sure. <laughs> I could just see your mom being like, "Well, your dad started smoking again." And no, that, hey, <laughs> that's that's great. Um, how far away is your parents' house? How far away are they from you guys? Uh, Twelve hours. Oh, so they're in Mississippi. Golly, man, you're yeah. you have a how, how old's your youngest? Uh, two. And that two year old is not going to see y'all for the whole summer. Uh, well, so we we plan a, a midway visit to basically to kind of. Uh, you know, hang out and for a few days. Okay. And uh, so and I, yeah, it, it's we're, we're testing that. This is the first summer we're we're trying it. Okay. And, uh, it wouldn't surprise it, it, me if that two year old or that I guess there's a four year old. If a two and the four year old end up needing to come home halfway through, maybe. Right. Um, that wouldn't surprise me. That that's a lot, a lot of separation from mom and dad for a two and a four year old. It is just developmentally. That's a lot, but uh, maybe with their brothers and sisters. Eight, six, and five. I mean, even five. That's that's a long time. But all I'd say, that's not even why you called. So if I always find myself in your situation, so you're thinking about selling the house y'all live in, it'd be so much, it's easier to do everything. Just It's just going to the bathroom 
is so, so much easier. Um, right. Having breakfast is so much easier. But you're thinking about selling your house and moving to a whole new place? Well, it's basically, you know, I mean, the housing market is crazy, but uh, we, we, my, we, my wife was looking up home values and realized that, like, basically for the price, for the value of ours, we could, there's, like, new developments and new neighborhoods growing up that have much more, you know, playgrounds and things like that. And so we could uh, potentially give, you know, be in a better situation, more rooms for the same price. So I could, you know, uh, as we currently are in, where we're in like 1960s home, where at any point, you know, something could really go wrong. Uh, we, we could end up being in a newer one with the same money, basically. Yeah. I mean, and, and new things are going to go wrong and I mean, in new houses too. So uh, what I, what I want you to do is to, if y'all decide to move, great. I don't want you to create a bunch of problems where you live now. I'd much rather you see some opportunity somewhere else. Yeah. Right. Um, cause your house, I, I'm, I'm convinced that the house you're in right now, you could raise all, all five of these kids and you and your wife, and it would be tight and it'd be maniacal and you'd be loud and all those things. But y'all could do it. You're seeing some new developments that have some cool amenities that you guys want as your family that might make your life more fun or a little bit easier or whatever. No, th that, that's all well and good. So if you were to sell your house and let's pretend it sold in 30 days and you were going to move and let's pretend in August, August 1st is your move date and you're out of here and um, your two-year-old and your four-year-old have come back home. Um, here's what I would do in that situation. I would have a place picked out that I'm, I put an offer in, this is going to be our home. I would not say, Hey, we're thinking about moving this or that or that or this or anything like that. I would say we found a place and here's why those kids that young, the ambiguity, the, you instantly pull the tether out. It doesn't make sense. Whereas you and your wife are like, Hey, we should look at some houses that can become fun and that can become an adventure for a kid. It can be unsettling. But okay. you guys, you guys find a place. Here's where we're going to go. Then you take pictures of where their bedrooms will be and what we're going to move. Um, it's a, it's, it's Piaget and it's old. We're going to move into very concrete. This is going to be your room. What color would you like it to be? Red or orange, orange or pink. And that way they get the concreteness. We are moving to a new house. Hey, look, here's a picture of the pool. Here's a picture of the playground. Here's some things that are going to be very real in our lives. And you get some ownership in this move, however small it might be. And by giving them some ownership, they are, have a vested interest. They move, I, I can't describe it other than they move into that choice and that decision. And when they walk in, that sense of this is all new and this is all kind of freaky is also, I picked that color. That's mine. And this yeah. is my room or this is our, like if you're sharing rooms, this is our room and we picked this. And maybe you ask, do you want a baseball poster or a Hello Kitty poster? I don't know what your kids are into, but find right. one or two little, little variables that they get a choice in all the way down to your, maybe even your four-year-old, but for sure your, your, your eight-year-old, I guess you have a six, you have a seven or yeah. something like that, five-year-old, something like that. Yeah. 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 Eight, six. Five, three, two, I think. Okay, yeah. So yeah. you're eight and you're six and you're five-year-old. I would sit them down separately than the other two and say, we're going to have a big kid conversation. We found an amazing new house that's going to give more space, that's going to be by a new park and a pool, and they're going to go, wow, and then one or two of those kids, if not all of them, will go, but I like our old house, and what about my room? And that's when you can say, check this out. And you can have an iPad for them or even put on a big screen TV and say, this is going to be your room, and you get to pick between baseball or football or whatever and like whatever and whatever, and you get to pick this color. Which one do you want? And just go through it that way. And that way, when they show up, it's more of a sense of ownership and not a sense of they pulled the wool out from under me. The worst right, thing you could yeah. do was just drive home <laughs> and pick and them up like, new house? and be like, yeah. new house. And then they will never feel settled for the rest of their life. That's not true. That They would be fine. But um, I definitely wouldn't do that. But I would I would bring them into it when you have some some security. This is where we're moving. This is the house. And when they can have tiny little bits of ownership. Um, I think okay. that's that's awesome. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. I, I, the older ones were my main concern. And then, uh, 
yeah, who, who knows? We might get to getting everything house ready and then decide, hey, we still really like this house. But I had a um, um I had a, a, a professor, a counseling professor, her name's Aretha Marbley. She's just um really important person in my life. She gave me some advice when my wife got pregnant with Josephine, um, six years after we had Hank. And she said, you can avoid all of the problems that having uh, that the first kid experiences with your second kid. If you will just do one thing. And I rolled my eyes and I was like, whatever. Everybody's giving me all this stupid parenting advice. And she said, just from this point forward, start referring to your wife's pregnancy as his baby. Just his baby. And what I didn't understand developmentally at the time um, was he was very, very young, but he was so desperate. Kids are so desperate for any shred of ownership. Um, and as parents, we can't give them a lot of ownership. And we're, there's some kind of weird cultural zeitgeist where it's like, we, they do what we tell us and we tell them. That's terrible parenting. But if we teach them little bits of, hey, here's what ownership looks like and feels like, and you get to pick this. And if one of them throws a temper tantrum, I don't want to move, I hate this, that's fine. You just took their, like, their, you move their house on them. That's cool. When right. you're ready to come back and have this conversation, we'll be happy to. I'm sorry that you're choosing to throw a temper tantrum over a really neat thing, but I do understand that this is scary for you. So when you're ready to choose what room color you want, come on back. We, we can't wait for you to be here. And I'm going to let them go have their little fit and go do their little thing. I, I, I'm not going to get affected by that. I'm going to do what's best for my family, right? Um, but, man, you give them a little bit of ownership, whether it comes to having a brother or sister. You give them a little ownership into um, their appearance and how the room looks. Or little bits of ownership, uh, man, goes such a long, long way with, with um, childhood development. So, well done, man. <laughs> I don't know how y'all pulled the scam of the century, sending all five of those kids away, but well done. Well done. And um, best of luck to you, man. If you do get a new house, send us a picture and we'll post it up here, man. Can't wait. We'll be right back. Good folks. Slowing down is a critical aspect of mental health. Calming music, prayers, meditation, they're all great ways to find peace. And Hallow makes it easy to start a daily practice of meditation. Hallow is the number one prayer app in the world. And you can tailor content towards your faith tradition. From scripture readings and prayers to journaling, Hallow makes it easy to practice prayer, meditate, and build a deeper, more meaningful spiritual life and rediscover true peace. Go to hallow.com slash Deloney today to get three months of Hallow for free. Hallow.com slash Deloney. All right, we're back. Let's go out to Dear Marie in what Madison, Wisconsin. What's up, Marie? Hey, Dr. John, it's a little surreal to be talking to you. <laughs> it's very surreal to be talking to you. I promise. What's up? Uh, uh, I am calling, and I'll just phrase my question first, but I am calling because um, of my sister. I would like to know how I can still possibly help her out, but protect my family and her sanity as she is a child in an adult body and is making choices day to day that are devoid from reality. And I can definitely give you kind of the backstory. <laughs> yeah. Is, is she a child in adult body cognitively? Like she's got, um, she's got cognitive impairment no, or is no, she just, just an adult being a moron? Pretty much the second. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Tell um, me more. I want to hear this story. Um, so I am an adult scapegoat child. Um, I left home over 12 years ago and went no contact seven years ago with very few exceptions. Literally my exception is funerals and my grandma's 90th party. Um, How old are you? I help my... I am uh, 32. Okay. All right. So uh, I helped my sister, uh, who is a doormat or invisible child, um, get out about six years ago now. And she only decided to leave, quote unquote, after a very uh, traumatic event that her parents had put her through, but she still maintains contact. What's that event? Which, what's that? What's the event? The event that I'm calling about today? No, what's the traumatic event she escaped oh, from? The traumatic, the, the traumatic event that uh, she uh, had was, it's really messy. But um, so there is a, a man that showed up um, in our life. And um, my parents, I have, I'm, we're part of a family of eight kids. So I nailed us to the eight. Um, she was the second. And then there's a third one. And the third one is definitely narcissistic. My, my mother is the narcissist too in the family, if that um, helps. But the traumatic event was this man showed up and my parents were kind of trying to, for he wanted to be with Kayla. Kayla said he was like, quote unquote, dating, dating her secretly. And they were forcing him onto our third sister, Teresa, 
And he told her at some point that he's like, I want to be with you. I'm going to date you. I'm going to tell your parents today. And then what ended up happening was he got there. And my dad's like, you need to choose. You need to choose. And he was like pretty much screaming, yelling in his face. This is what my sister has informed me about. And she, uh, um, she said that he's like, all right, I choose sister three. And Kayla was just completely devastated after that. And then he just jumped in his car and laughed. And that was it. And it's like, a, like an old but, Bible story. Like, oh, it is. Yeah, it is. How, old, how old was your sister? Uh, oh gosh, this is six plus years ago. So like 20, 24, 25 when this happened. How old was sister all number adults. three? Uh, 18 months younger than that. So there's 18 months between the first four. So um, they were 23 and 24 or 25 living at home. Yep. <laughs> and, and your dad was trying to arrange marriage them with this this mystery yeah. man. The other messy part, by the way, is he was also engaged to someone else. And I found this out from his sister, her adopted sister. All right. This this is like so, even Jerry Springer would be like, all right, that's <laughs> that's that's enough of this. All right, so so yeah. you want to help your sister. So as your sister, does she still live at home? Has she moved out or what? No, she she's moved out, and this is actually why I called. So okay. she just informed me a few weeks ago that she's seven months pregnant, closer to eight now. Okay. And my husband and I just had our first child here back. We've been married six years, but we just had our first child in January. And she claims that she didn't tell me because we were expecting our child and she didn't, didn't want the focus to be on that. And she knew how I had to react. It was more reacting to the father because as um, I, I know, you know, is there's a lot of repeat with relationships we have to relive the trauma almost. Mm -hmm. And my sister has been going to therapy for five years, but she continues with the relationships where people are emotionally, mentally, and financially abusing her, all things that her family did. And the father of her child, he is one of those toxic abusive types. And at the time I wrote in, we were aware of four times that he's cheated um, this is during the first phase of them dating and second phase started up again last year. And just this week I learned that she, she had put a tracker on his car last year and found out that he was cheating again. So now there's five total times. And um, it was my aunt that told me this, not my sister. Um, my sister also has admitted that he's financially abused her in the past. Five weeks ago, she moved in with him. Okay. So how can I help you? What do you want to do? Well, <laughs> I want to help her, but she went she, and you she can't. had reached out to me. You can't. I know, I, I know, but she had reached out to me that she wanted out because she called me saying that it was really messy and how bad it was. I am very worried about her. Yeah. Because pretty much I've taken care of all my siblings my whole life. I was the, not only a scapegoat, but I was the parent. Yeah. So and, here's what needs to happen really quick, okay? And this is just yeah. you. And then we can get to the other things, the other people, okay? There's part of this frantic, I can hear it in the call. There's part of this frantic need to be the person who's out. Like you're the, you're the, the scanner system for everybody in the family, for the brothers and sisters, for the who's dating who. And your body is running on drama. It's running on cortisol and adrenaline. It's how, it's how you operate. And you've been running that way since you were a little bitty girl because you grew up in chaos with really crappy parents. Fair? It's fair, but I honestly, Dr. John, I run from trauma, which is why I call because I'm ready to run again away okay. from this because okay. I don't want this in my family. Okay. Or my family being my husband and my child. Sure. Absolutely. So here's the only way it works to balance. I really, really love my family members and I want to take care of them. And they are um, making really poor decisions. And I'm not going to allow that poison into my home because this cycle stops with me. Yeah. Right? So yeah. Here's, here's what that means. I'm never, the moment somebody starts to tell me about one of my sister's boyfriends, I'm, I'm, I end that conversation. Done. I don't want to hear it. Don't care. I don't want to hear it. Okay. The moment somebody starts talking about, well, did you hear your sister? Did she? Nope. Don't want to hear it. I, 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 I'm not going to engage in that sort of gossipy conversation. I'm clearing my okay. life of that mess. I will talk to my sister on a regular basis of some sort. And if my sister wants my help, here's what that's going to look like. You will get rid of your cell phone. You will never contact this guy again. You'll go to court and get full custody. You like whatever you need to do because you're not bringing that insanity into my house. 
and yeah. I want you in my house. Here's the thing. She's going to have to make grown-up choices. Yeah. And you're going to have to make grown-up choices too. But we have to we have to create a place of 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 steel and concrete so that anybody who needs help can anchor into it. And right now, you care about them so much, you're willing to dive back into that mess that you've spent so long healing from. Well, to, to an extent, I'm, I'm not willing to dive into it, which is why I'm calling because... Okay, that's fair. She started, re, she, she started reneging because it, it, this is kind of why I said my, my boundaries and I've been very hardcore. It is funerals. If I know they're going someplace, I will not go. Good. Like, cause Good I, I don't. I don't... It, it's hard. And my husband has watched me. Like, it was so hard walking away and it happened right before we got married because I uninvited them because my mother being who she is. But... um. And hey, I, just, I I would stop with all diagnostic language. Yeah, sorry. Like no, I'm I'm just saying this. Like it'll it'll give you peace. I I yeah, I've, more, more peace. <laughs> well, I, I I mean I'm trained in that, and I don't yeah. refer to my friends as like that guy's got depression and that guy's got anxiety. Yeah, I don't even do that, and I know all the lingo. I just will simply say, yeah, that person makes me feel uncomfortable, or that person brings too much chaos. I'm just gonna I'm gonna bow out. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if, right. if your mom has narcissistic personality disorder, yeah. if she's just mean, if she has a lot of trauma in her childhood. Here's the deal. doesn't matter. Yeah. She treated you like crap and she stole from you and was abusive and your dad's tra trafficking his adult daughters in a weird way. Like, just the whole thing's just a mess. <laughs> and so, yeah. I'm out. Like, I, yeah. I'll leave your diagnostics to the psychiatrist. I'm out. Um, I'm going to go create a great life. And if you can, move across the country. I actually did. Good. But <laughs> My husband was unhappy, so we partially okay. moved back, but I put my foot down. I would not move back to the state that everyone was in. <laughs> that, I mean, so you're like, um, so you're proving me wrong. You are really working hard to heal, and that's awesome. You have, yeah, it's, it's so, just, this is the one sister that I have contact with, because like I said, I helped her out, but she's, these choices she's making, now she has a baby girl that she's about to have, is Part of me, again, this is where my, my go-to for response has always been flight. That's why I'm a workaholic and I know it. But it's just, is this the time where I have to, I guess, fly, run again and just walk, uh, like, walk away, but always let her know the door is open when she is ready to actually make those adult decisions. I think you're done running. <laughs> okay. But, but I think that you now have gone out to the front of your property and built a pretty firm boundary. Okay. And so I don't want you to look at saying no as some sort of trauma response. It's, this, is, this is you speaking out of a position of strength and health. This okay. is what healing looks like, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> we think that when we heal, it's going to be like, all oh, right, everything's going to be awesome. It's yeah, not. It's not. Because the world <laughs> around us peace, hasn't yeah. healed. In fact, sometimes getting well, healing, and, and living in a peaceful situation um, can be unnerving. One, because our nervous system only knows chaos, and when it has... No chaos. It will either spin it up and create it, or it will try to go achieve something to make us feel good. We got to get a drill in somewhere, right? Or yeah. Um, yeah. it will feel like depression. It will end up just sitting there drinking or Netflixing our lives away. And so I get that impulse, but this sounds like yeah. you're operating not from a trauma response, not from running, but it sounds like you are like you've drawn a hard line and yeah. you can go out to the gates and you can hand her a piece of paper that says, here's the, here's what it will take for you to come to my home. Okay. And that can be whatever you and your husband decide it's going to be. And yeah. she needs to know if she comes to your house or if she becomes a part of your life, here is what will get her sent away. All right. If you bring an abusive man into this home, if you're in contact with somebody that's abusive, you're allowed to do that, but you cannot live here. If you swear, if you smoke in the house, I don't care. I don't care what it is. Yeah. Um, you can, you can make any rules you want cause it's your place. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, what you, what you can give somebody over time. Here's my guess. My guess is she's going to get really mad at you. Like you're leaving me. Like you, you're, you're just bailing on me or you're all high and mighty or you escaped and it's how lucky it is to be you and all that nonsense. And yeah. you're going to choose guilt over resentment every single time. Cause you don't ever want to hate your sister, right? No, I, I, I don't hate my sister. I know, I know but, but if she moves into your house with this new little baby and that boy comes around and then that boy, you walk in one day yeah. and that man is alone with your kid, and all, you will hate yeah. your sister. We're not going there. Yeah. We're going to choose guilt. We're going to put strong boundaries up and if sister doesn't, doesn't, um, doesn't 
li- li- live into the boundaries you make for your life and for your family, then she's opting out. And I'm going to feel guilty about that because I want to help her, but she's choosing not to not not to take help right now. Yeah. Right. You getting back in that chaos isn't going to help. <laughs> Is there any way that you know of where you can? Because she she's almost creating a, a delusional world right now. Like I said, she was open to moving, talk to him, and just being who he is. Um, it's just she's no. Like, the hair isn't all right. No, the only one that I know of is constant touches with reality, and that is you deciding I'm going to write her a letter every week okay. that just tells her I love her, and here's a great thing that happened, and here's the weather. I'm talking about some very detailed reality things. Okay. Um, or I'm going to call you once a week and we're going to talk for 30 minutes. And then at 30 minutes, your watch is going to beep or your phone's going to beep and you're literally going to say, all right, I got to run. Have a great, even if it's in the middle of a, of a, of a conversation, you're going to, what you're doing is you're, you are modeling in real time, what boundaries look like, what peace looks like. Hey, me and my husband are going on a date tonight. So we got a big romantic one planned. We got a babysitter coming over. So y'all have a great night. I'm going on my date. Oh, it must be nice. Oh my gosh. I wish I, yep. Yeah. It's really incredible, and I hope you'll join me someday. Have a great one, and I'm hanging up, right? I'm getting out. Um, but no, there's no way that you can get involved and make her choose not this guy who's a gaslighter and a whatever and a whatever and a whatever and a partridge and a pear tree. You can't do anything about that. You can provide an alternative, um, an alternative place of peace and safety for her, but she's going to have to opt in. And I hate that for both of you. I especially hate it for that little bitty baby girl that's on the way. Because that little baby girl didn't didn't ask for any of this nonsense. But dude, I'm proud of you, Marie, for getting out. I'm proud of you for creating strong boundaries and saying not for me and my family, not anymore. And I know that that felt like once we got established, everything was going to be just, ah. And it's not. Sometimes when we heal, our eyes are open to just how chaotic and madhouse the rest of the world actually is. Create a peaceful home and then create the boundaries by which people can enter it and choose guilt over resentment every time. We'll be right back. It seems so easy, but most of us way undervalue real, genuine relationships. Our friendships, our marriages, we don't know what we're doing and instead of diving into the mess, we accept shallowness and distraction and we wallpaper over our loneliness. So let me say this boldly. You cannot be well alone. You've got to get connected to real life people and have deep, powerful relationships. I'm talking about relationships where you can be honest, where you can open up, where you can share hard things, and you each know that you'll still show up for each other. And in my new book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future, we'll walk through a not-so-complicated approach to relationships, mental health, and wellness, and getting connected is a key part of that. That's why you'll learn shallowness and loneliness are so dangerous. And more importantly, you'll learn how to create meaningful relationships in your life moving forward. There is no good app to help adults find friendships, but this book can help. Go to johndeloney.com to take the next step towards wellness. That's own your past, change your future at johndeloney.com. All right, we are back. Um, Got an email here from Victoria Locke. Pretty amazing. Victoria says, I'm sitting next to my mom who's on hospice after a two-year battle with brain cancer. Last year, my best friend from college told me the classic, if there's anything you need, you let me know. And she added, if your mom wants to backpack the Grand Canyon again, I will help carry gear for her. I dismissed this offer at first thinking it was crazy. However, I later decided that it was worth a shot. I bought the permit and started planning. My friend brought two friends, two of her friends to help. My sister, Brittany, came too. To make a long story short, we pulled off the trip and I will never regret doing it. I'm just going to pause right there. What a great friend. Like, metaphorically and in, in reality, I'll carry your gear. When you can't, I'll be there. To make a long story short, we sh- short we pulled off the trip and I'll never regret doing it. We laughed together, had questions for humans conversations. Yes. Saw the stars, drank wine, chased sunsets, ran away from rain, and had a generally good time. 
Mom gave me a beautiful example of what it looks like to live fully and courageously no matter what life hands me. And she got an example. Deep in her soul. Of what raising an extraordinary daughter looks like. Because she raised a daughter who would grow up to be an amazing woman who had great friends and who knew what care and compassion looked like and knew what planning looked like and knew what um, hard, scary things, we're going to do them anyway because we only got one more shot looks like. Your mom gave you a gift, but Victoria, you gave her, I can't, I can't imagine a greater gift from my kids. Because of my mom, I will choose to treat this one life like the precious gift it is. Victoria, that's incredible. Thank you for sharing this. Thank you for taking questions for humans with you down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Those cards have ended up in places I never in a million years would have imagined. But the thought of a mom dying from brain cancer and her daughter and her daughter's friends sitting in the bottom of the Grand Canyon, laughing, telling stories, drinking a little bit too much, doing questions for humans, Looking at the stars. Whew, man, that can get me choked up. Thank you for allowing me to have uh, a teeny tiny little um, place in this amazing story. You're a good daughter raised by an extraordinary mom. She's lucky to have you as you were lucky to have her. Thank you all so much for listening to the show. That's it for today. Stay in school. Don't do drugs. Have fun and make good choices. We'll see you soon. Love you all.